I'm Hannah McDonald with the Alliance Francaise de Chicago, and today I will be reading Part 2, Chapter 12 from Bourgeois Tristes by Francoise Segon. The funeral took place in Paris, in fine sunshine, with a crowd of curious onlookers and much black. My father and I shook hands with Anne's elderly relatives. I looked at these ladies inquisitively. They would most likely have come to our home to take tea with us once a year. People looked at my father with sympathy. Webb must have spread the news about his planned marriage. I caught sight of Cyril looking for me on the way out. I avoided him. The resentment I harbored against him was completely unjustified, but I couldn't help it. People around us deplored the dreadful, senseless thing that had happened, and, as I had still some doubts as to whether the death had been an accident, I was glad about that. On the way back in the car, my father took my hand and held it against his. I thought, I am all you have left, and you are all that I have left. We are alone in our unhappiness. And for the first time, I wept. It was not unpleasant to shed tears. It was quite unlike that emptiness, that terrible emptiness that I felt in this clinic when, while looking at the print of Venice. My father offered me his handkerchief wordlessly, his face ravaged by grief. For a month, the two of us lived as widower and orphan girl, taking all our meals together and not going out. We sometimes spoke a little of Anne. Remember that day when we spoke about her cautiously and without looking at each other for fear of causing ourselves hurt or lest something be triggered in one or other of us that might result in something irreparable being said. Our wariness and our consideration for each other had their reward. We were soon able to talk about Anne in a normal way, speaking of her as of someone dear to us with whom we would have been happy, but whom God had called to himself. I am writing God instead of chance, but we did not believe in God. We were fortunate enough in the circumstances to be able to believe in chance. Then one day at a friend's house, I met a cousin of the friends whom I liked and who liked me. I went out with him a lot in the course of just one week, as one does with a person, frequently and foolheartedly, when a love affair is just beginning, and my father, who was not well suited to being on his own, did likewise with a rather ambitious young woman. Life took up again along its old lines, as it was bound to. Whenever my father and I are together, we laugh and talk about our conquests. He must suspect that my relationship with Philippe is not platonic, and I know perfectly well that his new girlfriend is costing him a lot of money. But we are happy. Winter is nearly over. We shall not be renting the same villa again, but a different one near Joan Lepin. Only when I'm in bed at dawn, when all that can be heard in Paris is the sound of cars, my memory sometimes betrays me. Summer, with everything I remember of it, comes flooding back. Anne, Anne. I repeat that name very softly to myself, over and over in the dark. Then something stirs within me that, with eyes closed, I greet by its name, sadness. Bonjour, tristesse. That's all. Thank you.